Establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And verse 9. Now that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich, and to all who call upon him. We are the Gentiles, in case you're wondering. We are the ones who weren't chosen. But we were the ones who accepted Christ without knowing him, without knowing much about him. The Israel died, said, in your part, they showed us what Christ was like and what we wanted to be like. And even a few of them joined to be a Judas, a gun part of the Israel community. And even then they weren't accepted. They still aren't accepted. They believe they're so much older than anybody else. So self-righteous, if you will. But they believe they can do anything they want. And God will save them. Well, God says, no, that ain't the way it is. I gave you the rules. I gave you the ways it's supposed to be. And you will follow them. Or you will, like a branch of a bad tree, be cut out. And so we were planted in the place. Grafted into their society that we too may have a part of Christ's love. Now you might think, well, I'm not qualified, I ain't worthy. But listen to this. Two people in the Bible, Jacob, Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah was drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was murdered. Get into his insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Martha was a worry. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was a booty. Mary Magdalene was a hooker. Moses stuttered. Zacharias was short. Abraham was old. And Lazarus was dead. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. That's us. We're not qualified, but he will make us right. He will make us whole. He will make us complete. As we gather around the table, take the bread and the cup. Let him into your heart. Ask him to come in. Ask him to make you whole. Ask him to take control of your life. He knows you're not perfect. But he had the plan for you. All you have to do is accept it. And that's easy. By believing in him, by trusting in him, and accepting his word, and then doing his will. And you, too, can be saved. As we gather on the table, we take the cup, ask him into your lives. Let's pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we come to your house. We come to praise your name in song and word. 
We pray, your Lord, that you'll continue to watch over us and guide us as we gather around your table to take the bread and the cup to remember what Jesus did for us as he died upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Enter into our lives, Lord, and take control. Fill us with your spirit that we may be more loving, more kind to all our, all our friends and neighbors. And who was our friend? Who was our neighbors? Not just the guy who lived next door, but the guy also on the other side of the world. They are our friends. They are our neighbors. We do let them know that you are the only one. And through you, there is salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is the third, <coughs> third straight Sunday that God has given us this amazing, glorious spring day to enjoy. Yes. You know, scriptures say this is the day the Lord has made. I would rejoice and be glad in it. You know, we're supposed to do that every day, but it's just a little bit easier on the day. <laughs> This morning uh, we're continuing on in the uh, message is, uh, in Ephesians, the series of Ephesians, and we're looking at Ephesians 4, 17 through 5, 20. If you want to turn to that, I'll get to that in just a, just a little bit. You know, the, the world is a very dangerous place if you have to be above. You know, there's any number of large, hungry, Predators wanting nothing more than to have you for lunch. And as delectable as the bugs might be, you know, they, they're not without their own little survival strategies. I've always thought it's fascinating how God has created insects with this variety of tools at their disposal that allow them not to get eaten. You know, one of the main ones of these tools is just quite simply camouflage. You take, you know, you look at butter, butterflies and moths, for example. You have butterflies and moths that look so much like a leaf that you or I would just simply miss them. You know, you would look at it and think it's just a leaf on a tree. You have others whose coloration is so exact that they're able to just sit on the bark of a tree and just become invisible. And birds and other uh, other predators just miss them. Then you've got that whole there's a whole array of them with these big spots on their wings that. When they spread their wings, they, they look like either something much less palatable than what they are, or perhaps some other big aggressive creature with huge eyes. And in that way, they're able to spoof the hunters. You know, other butterflies and moths, though, are created with completely opposite survival strategies. And these are the ones that instead of relying on camouflage, you know, fitting in and, and being invisible, they were created by God with this garish coloration that just cries out, here I am. You know, take the monarch butterfly, for example. Monarch butterfly larvae, caterpillars, grow up eating milkweed, which fills them and fills the monarch butterflies themselves with this toxic chemical that's bitter and toxic to birds. So instead of common camouflage, God created monarchs with this just amazing orange, black, white coloration that just cries out, you know, here I am. They're beautiful, but to a bird, they're also like a neon, sh a neon sign shouting, don't eat me, I'm nasty. <laughs> you know, a bird who eats one of these probably remembers the experience and the butterfly that caused the experience and tries very hard never to make that mistake again. Okay, so where am I going with this? In this section in Ephesians, Paul seems very concerned about the Ephesian Christians and about their relationship to their surroundings, to the larger society and the larger culture in which they're living. You know, in the first century, the city of Ephesus had an environment in some ways kind of similar to our own modern day America. Ephesus was the crossroads of civilization and politically it was known as the supreme metropolis of Asia. The Roman governor of the region lived there, and it was a religious center of worship for the fertility goddess Diana, or as the Greeks said, Artemis. Her temple on the outskirts of the city was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Economically, Ephesus was a giant among first century cities. With its strategic location, it was the chief commercial center of Western Asia Minor, 
Its harbor brought ships from all over the Mediterranean, and its two major roads gave ready access to other cities along the coast and inland. And so the sailors and the traders that were constantly flowing into the city created this ready market for vices of all kinds, and a constant stream of full pockets to be emptied. Morally, the city was bankrupt. You know, we're seeing in our own nation the explosion of pornography and perversion. Likewise, Ephesus was controlled by the educated uh, prostitutes affiliated with Diana worship. And part of the cult of Diana, part of the religious expression of that particular religion, was ritual prostitution, where the devotee became joined with the goddess through her priestesses, ensuring the goddess's favor throughout the remainder of the year. One philosopher at the time commenting on the moral climate in Ephesus wrote that the inhabitants of this city were fit only to be drowned. And he said that the reason he could never smile or laugh because he lived among such terrible uncleanness. Which brings us to this next section, because here Paul speaks directly to the question of how should the Ephesians, and I guess by extension, how should we relate to this larger culture in which we live? Do we, like some butterflies, take on the coloration and mannerisms of the environment in which we live in an effort to just fit in and avoid conflict? Or do we take the opposite approach, living lives that are obviously different, that are out of sync with this culture and society, and therefore, thereby identifying ourselves loudly and clearly as followers of Jesus. Now, I doubt that any of you are wondering which direction Paul goes with this. So let's get into the text and see what he has to say. And this is a large passage, so I'm not just going to read the whole thing at the beginning like I do sometimes. Uh, we'll just take it piece by piece, section by section. And Paul starts by saying, our new life in Jesus calls us to be different, to stand out from the overall culture in which we live. And that's in verses 4, 17 through 24, where Paul says, So I tell you this, and I insisted on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul starts out this section by addressing this basic fundamental question of what is our relationship to our culture and society? And he says very clearly, very plainly, that we are to be different. We are to be very different. And this is the foundation for what he discusses in the rest of this passage. Very clearly, he says, we're not to be like the insects that camouflage themselves and fit in, and you can't hardly see them because they blend in so seamlessly with the environment. He says, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And then he describes what that looks like. It starts with a hardening of heart, an inability to appreciate the things of God, or even to know what the things of God are. And this hardening is manifested in corruption and deceitful desire, futility in thinking, loss of sensitivity to the promptings of God, indulging in every kind of impurity, full of greed, and so on and so on. He probably could have got, gone and layered on multiple other layers of description but I'm thinking he probably figured he'd made his point. That is not what Jesus is calling us to do and to be. After describing the Ephesian Gentiles, he gave us this wonderful analogy of the old self and the new self. And he says that before we came to know Jesus, we were living in conformity with the sinful culture. Now, we may not have sinned in exactly the same way as the Ephesians did, but we all had our own particular ways that we were doing it. In general, we conform, but once we come to know Christ, we take off that old self, that old person, the pre-Christian identity that we had, that person of conformity, and we put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, going back to the monarch butterfly, this is a good analogy of what Paul is talking about. 
you know, pre-Christian, we were that big, weird, green-looking caterpillar thing. And you know what happens with that? It goes into its chrysalis, and it comes out completely different, completely changed, beautiful. Just an awesome example of God's creation. This transition from old to new self that Paul is talking about is at that level of transformation. It makes us into something completely new, completely changed, and completely out of sync with our old nature and the prevailing culture. In the remainder of this passage, then, Paul goes on and just kind of works through the implications of this. Okay, what does that mean to us in terms of our day-to-day -day living? What does that mean to us to be this new create creation, this new creature? And he identifies five practical ways by which this difference, this new self, is manifested. And that's in verses 425 through 514. And we just take that piece at a time. In verse 25, Paul writes, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. First thing, we are characterized by truth, or you might say integrity, rather than falsehood. And the, although Paul specifically mentions speaking truthfully, I really think that it's much broader than this. It's not just telling the truth when he's talking about putting off falsehood. It's not just our speech. I think it's being the truth. You know, more broadly, I think we're talking about integrity, which the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines as the quality or state of being complete or undivided. You know, a person without integrity is fragmented. He's like the chameleon. You know, changing colors with his surroundings, being a different thing, depending on who he's around. He's one person on church on, at church on Sunday. He's another person at work. He's another person out golfing with the buds. And every time he gets into a new context or a new environment, you know, he changes his behavior, changes the way he talks, and changes the way he thinks. That's a person without integrity. A person with integrity has a single identity that defines who he or she is and out of which everything they are, everything they do, derives. <clears throat> Going back to verse 21, Paul says that the truth which is foundational to our identity, the truth that defines us as individuals and as a church, is Jesus. So as we live our lives as people with integrity, the truth that we're displaying to the world, the truth that unites all the bits and pieces of who we are is the person of Jesus. If Jesus is at the center of our lives, if Jesus is at the center of our thoughts, our attitudes, our choices, our actions, our identity, all of these things are changed and we're enabled by His Spirit to become people of integrity, people who have put off falsehood and live a life of righteousness and holiness as Jesus lives His life in us. People that don't change with the context. The people who are always people of integrity. The second piece going on. Paul goes on and says in verses 26 through 27 that we are people that resolve our anger quickly and well. Where he says, in your anger do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. And I, I've always loved this passage because it's so real. Paul doesn't say don't be angry with each other. Okay, that would be ludicrous. That's pie-in-the-sky nonsense. You know, as I said last week, we were talking about the people, and I said, you know, let's face it, we can be annoying. <laughs> we can annoy each other. And there's some times that we just get angry with one another. And some, you know, weirdly, it's often with the people that we love the most and are the most committed to, we, we fire off on so quickly. So it's cool, I think, that Paul doesn't say, don't get angry. He recognizes that, hey, we're all human. We're all living in a broken world. It's going to happen. What he does say is that when it happens, here's what you do. You get about the business of resolving it quickly. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It's just a fancy way of saying, resolve your anger quickly. Don't let it fester. Don't save it for a rainy day. Don't. Don't hold it in for, wait for that next argument that you can drag it out and woo, you know, blow it all up again. Don't stop speaking to each other for the next week. Work through it now, soon, immediately, before the end of the day. Calm down, get your wits about you, and restore the relationship. And the reason why that's so important is that if we don't do that, Satan's just waiting in the wings to weasel in 
and take what should be a very temporary situation, an abnormality in the relationship, and make it something that's much more lasting, something much more permanent, and something much more destructive. He loves nothing more than to take a momentary outburst of anger and turn it into a destroyed relationship or a destroyed marriage or a destroyed church. And that's why Paul says, get over it now, resolve it now. Don't let the sun go down on this. The third thing that he talks about in verses 29 through 32 is that our words should reflect our new identity and our new priorities. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. There's two parallel passages in this little section here. Verses 29 on the top, verses 31 and 32 on the bottom. And basically they're saying the same thing. And Hebrew does this a lot. That's kind of the way the language works. It makes a statement and then comes back and makes a statement again and, and elaborates on it. Here in these two parallel passages, Paul is contrasting unity and loving, compassionate relationships on the one hand with everything that destroys unity and loving, compassionate relationships on the other hand. Unwholesome talk, by which he means gossip and slander. Things that are relationally destructive. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, malice, slander. All of these things. He says, get rid of those things. They, they hurt the unity and the relationships in the church. And I think with that in mind, we're able to decipher the meaning of this middle second verse, verse 30, where he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, in this context, remember the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is working in and among us as the source of our unity, our peace, our compassion, our pain, our patience, our kindness, all those things that bind us together and make and allow us to relate together meaningfully in unity. <coughs> The Holy Spirit is the driving force by which we become, as a community, a temple of God, a dwelling place for God in Christ. And for that reason, anything that tears that unity apart grieves the Spirit because it destroys the work that He is so invested in. <coughs> the, next, uh, the next piece, number four, that Paul talks about, Verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. He says that our lives are to be consecrated to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse jesting, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And then he finishes off, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. In the Lord, live as children of light. For the truth, for the fruit of light exists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. In this passage, Paul comes back to this contrast that he's making all the way through here between the prevailing culture and society and what God is calling us to be. And he goes through this long list of sinful practices at the beginning, stating that these are improper for God's holy people. Now, the Greek word translated holy here is hagios. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but uh, it's in the ballpark, which generally means set apart or consecrated <coughs> to God. Now we consecrate something when we set it apart for some kind of special use. You know that fancy dinner service that all of us have but never sees the light of day? That's what consecrated means. You know, if the queen ever stops by, we'll drag that out, we'll set it out, and we'll have this, we'll use it, and then we'll have this wonderful dinner with this with this special service. 
But you'd never think of dragging those dishes out to the fish camp and using them for hot dogs and beans around the campfire. Oh, wait, there's one with poop. Those are for special. Paul is saying, we are for special. God has pulled us out of the darkness of the swamp that Paul describes, and he set us apart for himself that we might be children of light, that we might be light in the Lord, that we might be special people. And he ends this section with this interesting little statement. Find out what pleases the Lord. Think about that for a minute. You know, you and I, each one of us, has been set apart for something special. We've been consecrated to the Lord. But set apart for what? I think the statement of Paul suggests that the answer might be different for each of us. You know, if the answer was the same, Paul could have just said whatever it is that we're set apart to. He didn't say, well, you know, try to, try to figure out um, what pleases the Lord. But instead, like you say, he commands us to figure it out. Think of those dishes again. They've been set apart for something special, but special what? And I think the answer is going to be, this, the answer is going to be very, you know, What's special enough to get those table dishes on the table is probably different in my house than it is in yours. Although, I, have we ever used ours? <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever had an event that's special enough to pull those things out. But anyway, um, you know, you might use yours for birthdays and holidays. Uh, somebody else might be hanging on to it for the visit from the queen. I don't know. But, you know, we're, we're all a little bit different. I think it's the same with our consecration to the Lord. He's setting me apart for one thing. He might be setting you apart for something else in this kingdom. Finding out what pleases the Lord means we need to look for. And this might bring us back to the spiritual gifts that we were talking about last week. We need to look for and pray about what God is calling us to do. What is it that we could do in this consecrated relationship that would really please God? What, what could we do in our life that would really please God? The fifth and final one, we maintain our focus on the Lord and His will. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 through 20, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here again, Paul in this passage is setting up this contrast. And this time it's between foolish living and wise living. You know, on the one hand, we have foolish living. We have the drunkenness and the debauchery. And I, I take this to be, you know, kind of the unfocused life. You know, we're just out for having a good time. We don't really have a purpose. We're just kind of bouncing around, doing whatever comes along. We're just taking up space and using oxygen. And in contrast to this, Paul says, that those who've been consecrated to God should live wisely. And I think given the social and cultural context in which we live, we need to be very intentional about our lives. We need to be looking for and taking advantage of those opportunities that come along that God puts in our paths, often regularly, to serve Him. We need to allow the Spirit to fill us and to allow that filling to affect the ways that we relate to each other and speak to one another and the ways that we relate to God from a posture of thanksgiving and joy. You know, the monarch butterfly doesn't have a choice in how it relates to his environment. God made it that way. It couldn't change if it wanted to. God made it to stand out, to be different. You know, really, didn't he do the same thing with, for us? Didn't he make us exactly the same way? To stand out, to be different, to run our flag up the flagpole and say, I have made a stand for Jesus. And I'm, I'm demonstrating this by the quality of the life that I'm living for him. When he calls us and we responded in faith, we died to our old life, rising out of the baptismal waters like a butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. We emerged as something very different from the self that went into the water. We emerge as a new person made in the image of Christ, filled and empowered with his spirit, it didn't make us to blend in to this crazy world that in which we live. He made us to take, his, to take a stand as his consecrated people. And in the unique ways in which he's made each and every one of us to be the very presence of Jesus 
in a world that needs him so very badly. So what Paul describes in this passage is a complete transformation that makes it utterly impossible to blend in any longer. And that's what God is calling us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, uh, that you've given us this amazing opportunity to be the very presence of Jesus in this world. And we know that that means that we simply can't blend in. We can't be like everyone around us. We have to be like Jesus. And that's going to look a little bit different in each of our lives, Lord. So we pray, God, that you would reveal to us what it looks like in each of our lives, for each one of us. How do we find out what pleases you the most? What are you calling us to do? What are you calling us to be? Who are you calling us to after? And Father, as we go from here, as we live out our life this week, we pray that you would just keep us from ever just fitting in. That, that you would allow us to stand out as Jesus would stand out if we were walking among us today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our invitation hymn.